Welcome back. So far in our data journey, we've focused on what we can do to our data. What's the best way, what's the optimal way to get our data to a place that we can start taking action from it. And so now we're gonna pull in PM Scores Practice Analytics, uh, a Planning Analytics Practice Lead, Rob Byerly, and he's gonna show us how we can start putting that data to work and start using it to inform great business decisions. Uh, before handing it over to Rob, though, we do have a greeting from IBM's Global Business Unit Director of AI Applications and Solutions, as well as a, a, a storied Bacon alum, Brian McGough. Good afternoon. My name is Brian McGough. I'm the Global Business Unit Executive from IBM's Data and AI Solutions Group. As part of this role, I get to work with clients and business partners like PM Square all over the world. I also get to work with some of the greatest products in IBM including planning analytics powered by TM1, which Rob Byerly is going to talk about in just a minute. You know, one of the things I find most fascinating about planning analytics is how diverse the use cases are amongst our clients. We have clients like Ancestry.com that has a mega TM1 cube that has over a quintillion cells. That's a billion, billion cells. We also have one of the largest retailers in the world that evolved from doing an annual plan to quarterly to monthly, and now they support a daily planning process because that's what their business needed. And planning analytics and IBM were there with the technology to meet those needs when they needed them. And we make that commitment to you as well. I'm not sure what the road ahead holds for your business, but I do know one thing. We'll keep investing in products like planning analytics to make sure that road is paved. And we'll keep investing in partnerships with companies like PM Square to make sure you can get down that road in the most effective and innovative way available. You know, it's not just enough that we have great technology. We have to make sure that the technology is utilized to its fullest capacity. And that means that we need to coordinate and integrate our planning processes, not just in finance, but across sales and operations and supply chain and everywhere else. So I look forward to hearing from Rob and seeing the presentation that he's about to give and hearing your questions and talking to you in some of the panel discussions later this afternoon. And with that, let me turn it over to Rob Byerley. So Rob, take it away. Thanks very much. All right, I'm going to go ahead. Hopefully, you guys can hear me. And let me share my screen here. All right, so welcome. Uh, we're going to be talking about planning analytics today. Um, like Chris said, my name is Rob Byerly. I am the planning analytics uh, practice lead uh, at PM Square. I've been working with Cognos products since uh, about 2005 and been consulting just shortly after that. Um, so, what is planning analytics, right? So, for those that are new to planning analytics, um, you know, it is a 64-bit in-memory OLAP cube data source, um, has lots of flexibility, um, allows you to have a connected and planning solution through some of the new tools that have been developed, and it can become the single source of the truth for your data. Um, you're able to pull in sources from different uh, operational systems, financial systems, um, any data across your organization, whether it's in a database, flat files, uh, we can ingest that data in and uh, you know be able to do some analytics, some reporting, uh, planning, uh, anything you want to do with that data, we can do within planning analytics. Um, planning analytics always uh, also encourages collaboration, right? There's some uh, commenting and uh, features that allow you to uh, interact with users that are contributing data, um, and it helps you collect data across the organization. Uh, some of the features, um, you know, planning analytics allows you to do automated data loads, so you can pull in that data, um, manipulate the data throughout the system, as well as, uh, you know, perform complex calculations and then export that data back out to another system, out to Excel, lots of flexibility there. Um, it has the ability for you to create custom defined hierarchies, um, not only based on attributes, but you can create your own custom rollups within the application. So that way you can define um, the way the data aggregates that may not be defined in your source system. Um, and so there's a little plug there that um, Brian Moore is presenting tomorrow, a hands-on training session. So make sure you've registered for that if you wanna get a feel for how to build custom defined uh, hierarchies based on attributes in your data. So there's also a 
web front end that allows you to do that reporting, dashboarding, and analysis. Uh, you can do visualizations of the data, and that tool is called Workspace. Um, for some of you folks that have been around uh, planning analytics uh, in TM1 over the years, uh, TM1 Web is still an option as well. And then, of course, um, Excel integration, right? We saw the survey this morning. We've heard, you know, you guys still live in Excel. We understand that. We support that. Um, so you can keep where your users are comfortable, um, but still have them connect back to that data source. That's your single source of the truth. Um, so some of the flexibility that you get with planning analytics is to be able to do what if scenario modeling. So you can create um, models that will allow you to kind of work off it off to the side with the source data, play around with it. And then if you decide that this is you know, the final iteration of your data and that you want to continue with it, we can commit that data back and it becomes the source data. Um, you can also throw those uh, scenario models away. You can hang on to them, archive them over the years, things like that. So one of the new features uh, that's out there is AI forecasting. So uh, this is with the newest release of the planning analytics workspace. And uh, when we get into the demo here, we'll talk about that as well. Um, and of course, with the IBM products, you can do on-premise or cloud deployments. Um, you know, most folks are going to the cloud these days, uh, reducing the uh, burden of having to maintain the servers. Um, but if you're, you know, just built out a brand new data center and you're not ready to go to the cloud, obviously we can do a local de deployment for you as well. So what are the benefits of using an integrated planning solution? Like I've said before, right, it's the single source of truth for your financial data. You can pull data in from multiple sources, marry that data up, look for um, trends and uh, opportunities in the data to be able to make financial decisions. Um, it'll allow you to improve the accuracy of your plans through collaboration. Um, and you can get better financial reporting and analysis and quicker turnaround on some of that reporting and analysis as well. Uh, TM1's planning analytics is very easy to use um, once you have your data loaded and built out into the model to do um, any kind of analysis and reporting becomes quite easy. It can also be consumed in Cognos Analytics as a data source. Um, so you could build your models in planning analytics and then use that in your reports and dashboards in, plan in Cognos. So some other benefits, obviously you can reduce errors and eliminate the manual processing and calculations. So if you're in Excel today and have lots of data uh, that you've been doing outside in Excel, we can pull those calculations in, create rules or processes that will help you calculate that data. And then you only have that calculation in one place and it can be maintained. So you don't have to, you know, every iteration of an Excel spreadsheet needs to be updated with the new calculation. Um, and again, if you can reduce or even eliminate the dependency on shared Excel files, um, you know, we can still interface with Excel and you can get data in and out from Excel. But if you're, uh, you know, trying to get away from that being your database, which Excel is not a database, right, we can we can help you get or eliminate or reduce that dependency on it. And a big benefit is your shorter planning cycles, right? We've got the capability to set up users where they can contribute data and they can um, they can get your data to you in an organized fashion a lot easier so and a lot quicker so you can also increase your revenue decrease your costs identify risks make faster business decisions and then again the what if scenario modeling using a concept called sandboxes which we'll see here in just a little bit So question to you guys is how can planning analytics help me in my organization? And this is just a sampling of, of some of the things that it's capable of doing. Um, we can design and build anything that you have. And especially if it's in an Excel file today, we can recreate that Excel file and build in the you know, central location that houses the data, help you set up assumptions, um, that drive the model, get you set up with dashboarding, reporting, and analytics uh, on that data as well. So sometimes people ask, you know, do I need a connected and integrated planning solution, right? And the answer to that is, you know, what, what do you want out of it? Are you looking to get better plans, uh, faster planning, 
uh, reduce the time gathering that data across the organization. You know, again, re reducing costs, increase your revenue, and then you know today's economic conditions, right? You want to be able to respond fast to the changing conditions uh, as well as reducing your risk. And then again, if you have people in your organization that are, um, you know, pulling data into Excel and consolidating it and trying to do reporting and analysis on it, um, we can automate those data loads and pull that data in, and we can uh, give you nice looking dashboards for your reporting and analysis. Again, if you've got people, you know, passing around Excel files on a shared drive or um, emailing them to kind of gather input from, you know, folks in the field, uh, we can, again, consolidate that into a single location where every everybody can go to input their data. And then, again, if you're making decisions based on gut instinct rather than data back decisions, right, this will help you if we can get all of your data together, organized, and present it back out, um, then you can make informed decisions based on that data. So another plug for Brian's session tomorrow, Unlocking Power of Attribute-Driven Hierarchies. Um, if you haven't registered already, uh, go to bacon.pmsquare.com and register for that hands-on training session that'll happen in Planning Analytics Workspace. And again, if you have questions, go ahead and start putting those into the questions or chat window, and uh, we'll come back to those around at the uh, end of the session here. So I'm going to jump into the planning analytics demonstration, which I have pulled up here. So what you're seeing here is the, um, oops, sorry, is the uh, new planning analytics version 57. Um, you can see that we're on that right here, 2057. Um, so a total new look and feel to the UI um, and some new features that have been deployed in here. Uh, such as the applications and plans and uh, the AI forecasting were some big releases or some big features that have come in this release. And again, this gives you this um, web portal to uh, go through and, you know, have a, a common front end with all of your financial data and other operational data. So the applications and plans, um, for those that have been around TM1, uh, it's, it's kind of like the old contributor workflow um, with the plans piece so you can organize your books and views and build a process around how your users are going to contribute data and then applications allows you to kind of just group things together and put an application together to make it easier for the users but there's no type of workflow in there reports and analysis that one lets you build reports based on um, the pre-existing model that's out there um, so depending on what you have access to you would be able to uh, you know, build reports and dashboards, you know, against that data. And then for the data modelers, there's the data and model section where you're able to build cubes and dimensions, processes, chores, update attributes, um, and basically maintain your model on the back end there. And then finally on the screen is the administration. So that allows you to manage the database instances that you have running as well as users and security. So a total different look and feel, looking a little more like Cognos these days. Um, where you've got the left-hand navigation, you've got shared folders, you've got personal folders, and then you've got users set up over here um, within the, the main landing page here. Um, another nice feature here is that you've got built-in search. So since we're in the, the main page, it's got some basic information, tutorials, links out to the documentation. Um, as well as, you know, some of the videos that IBM has put out around this. You've got links to the community and the What's New pages as well. So all of this stuff is kind of relevant to where you're at in the UI um, and will get you straight out to IBM documentation and content. So really nice to have that. All right. So I'm going to flip over here to my demo page. And uh, what we're looking at here is Planning Analytics Workspace again. And this is a book that we've assembled based on some sample data. And what we're looking at here is a company income statement. And um, for those that are not familiar with TM1, you do have multiple dimensions here. So each one of these boxes is a dimension. And then what we're seeing uh, assembled here is a cube that uses these dimensions. Uh, within the dimensions, you obviously have a hierarchy that you can build, right? So we've got um, locations that roll up to regions, regions that rolls up to total company. 
And so as we flip through, we can see the data changes um, based on what we select. So within the cube viewer here, right, we can move things around. We can nest things, you know, take something from the filters up top here and I can nest it onto the columns. And then you'll see we have actual with the months nested, budget with the months nested. We can flip those around and we can see those lined up. So we've got actual versus budget next to each other. Um, we do have a hierarchy built here within the accounts dimension, so we can expand and see what those sub accounts are that roll up underneath travel, as well as for payroll. All right, so I'm going to collapse this back down and I'm going to take my actual version and I'm going to drag that back up here and put it on my filter. And then now we've returned back to that original view. So the nice thing about Planning Analytics Workspace is we can export this to Excel. So I'm gonna click on the export and I want to check the box for the org. So that way I will get a single um, Excel file with 15 tabs, one for each level within that organization dimension. So I'll click on that and do the export. It just should take just a few seconds and we get our Excel file here. And there's our Excel file that I just opened. So we were at the total company level, but we did choose to export all of the org. Um, and you can see that we have the data on each tab for each org location. Um, now, these are not formulas that are hooked live back to the TM1 database. These are just a straight export of the values into Excel. But once you have this data out here in Excel, you can do whatever you like with it. Um, archive this off. You could uh, do any kind of Excel formatting and reporting, um, import it into some other system if that's what you need. But um, basically, this is get you an export of the data out of Planning Analytics and into Excel. Okay, I'll close that. All right, so I'm going to flip over to the um, compensation section of the income statement. And so here we're looking at Illinois for the 2021 budget. Uh, we've got year, quarter, and months going down on the rows, and we have the payroll accounts expanded and showing the FTE count. So this is just a little snapshot of your income statement, just specific to compensation. And if you notice, all of the values look the same for every month until we get to November. In November, which we'll see on this next tab of the employee input, um, is when merit increases come through. So then we have a higher expense, you know, starting in November and December. And so if we look here, right, we have an FTE count of five throughout the whole year for the budget, um, but we know that's not gonna be enough. So we're gonna hop over to the employee input page. And this is where your data could be loaded from a source system. So your HR system data could be pulled into here, loaded, and you may have employee names in here along with salary and uh, uh, the FTE count, things like that, right? So again, we're still looking at Illinois budget for 2021. Um, so these are annualized salary amounts. And then the total cost is the fully burdened cost with taxes and benefits. So in this case here, you can see we have five FTEs. You can see the trend line down here of FTEs. Um, and then what you're seeing here on the blue line is the monthly salary and bonus where you see the bump happens in November for, uh, you know, the merit increase period here. So in this scenario here, we're going to say that we're going to go hire a new employee here. So we're just going to put in a new employee. And then in the job type, we have a drop down here. And we know that we're going to hire somebody in the product management department. And then this job code is filtered based on product management. So I only get the job codes for the product management category. And if I switch this to sales, you'll see I get sales job codes. So I'm gonna stick with product management and we're gonna hire a, an analyst too. And they're gonna be a full-time employee and we'll just keep it simple, put in 100,000 with their merit period starting in November, just like everyone else. So the merit 
percent is set in an assumptions cube, and so that's set globally for all employees. And um, so this is set here, but we do have the option to adjust that merit percent if we needed to raise or lower that percentage amount. So with the merit percent, the new salary would be 105,000, and our fully burdened cost for the year would be 126,870, provided this employee started at the beginning of the year. So we know that employee one up here is gonna plan on leaving in May. So we're gonna go ahead and budget that we're gonna have that person leaving. And so you can see how that impacts the chart below. So your FTE number dropped, as well as your um, total cost for that employee. And we know, hey, we may not hire this new hire until let's say July. And so we can adjust that as well. And then like you see here, the fully burdened cost is adjusted to a start period of July. So we have a comment out here and we can you know, put some, some information in here. So we're gonna have a new hire to replace employee one as a note as to why we've budgeted for this new position. So at this time, what I'm gonna do is jump out to um, Excel and show the integration from Excel to planning analytics and how we could pull that similar view in. So I'm gonna to connect to my 24 retail instance, which is my sample data. And I'll get a panel over here on the right hand side showing me all of my cubes. And I'm going to explain, expand the employee cube and go down to my view called input 2021. And I'm just gonna create an exploration on this sheet. So this is gonna take that cube view that we saw on the last screen and pull it into Excel. And then you can see you have your employees um, list of employees, which is your numbers, your employee columns, and then Illinois 2021 budget, which is the exact same thing we were um, typing in on the other screen, right? So you can see my note that I put in here for the comment, that the new hire to replace employee one, and we've got my term period and my start period for those employees. So we could contribute data here if we you know, are comfortable in Excel and we wanna stay in Excel, but have that live connection back to the data. I could come in and make a change here. And then when I commit that data from Excel, it writes that back to the database. And if I go back to the database here and we look at the screen, I just did a refresh and my current salary changed to 90,000. My total cost for that employee has changed as well. So this is a good example of how your users can contribute data. It could be data that's loaded from your HR system, like I said, and then um, that gets you kind of the starting point of where your employee count per location or department is. And then you could have your budget users come in and contribute what they think they're gonna hire for the next year. Right. So I'm gonna jump over to unit price and revenue. So again, we're using a revenue assumptions cube here um, that allows us to change some values and uh, see the impact on the revenue on the, uh, the cross tab below, right? So again, now we're looking at a specific product here. Um, in this case, it's a 5G phone with 256 gigs of memory. And so we can come in and we can make updates directly to this data and it will write back to the database. But in this case, we want to kind of play around with the numbers and try some things out. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a sandbox. So this allows you to do your what if scenario analysis. Um, and then it also gives you the option to commit that data back. So we're gonna create a new sandbox. We'll call it revenue impact. And we'll make sure we're on revenue impact down here. We are. So we could come in here and say in July or August, right? And know that we wanna increase the unit price to let's say $260. And as soon as I make that change to unit price, you can see it lights up blue and it impacts my average unit price. But we also can look down into the revenue cube and see how that's going to impact our gross revenue and our gross margin. 
and our gross margin percent. And we can also see the numbers that have changed for the year. So here we have the ability to input those assumptions and see those impacts in how it would cascade through to revenue. So in this case here, maybe we want to change those numbers from August through the end of the year. So planning analytics gives you the ability to click on a cell and spread data, right? So with the spread data, it gives you lots of options where you can do spreading and you can control the direction of which those um, values will spread. So in this case, we're gonna say, hey, we wanna start with a value and grow it by 3%. So I'm gonna stick with my 260 that I had keyed in there to start with, but I'm gonna to try to grow it to the right and replace those values. And that will put new values in August through December. So keep in mind, we're in the sandbox here. So we're not actually writing this data back and overwriting any of the original data that was here. That only happens when we go and commit the data. The other thing is, as you start using these spreading functions and you start clicking around, it starts to build the formula for you. And so these are the keyboard shortcuts. Um, so once you get comfortable with some of the keyboard shortcuts, you can just type those directly into the cell without having to open the spread window. And you can see if we were to type GR with a right arrow, 260 is the starting value. And then a colon separates that from the growth percent of 3%. So this is one way to get that data spreading to hap happen. And I'm just gonna click apply here and you'll see our numbers have grown 3% every month to the end of the year. And again, the revenue cube was impacted down here as well. And you can see those changes from August through December and the total year. So I'm gonna jump over to the revenue and income statement and then we're gonna come back here and commit this data. But you can see um, that this revenue income statement showing our um, base data that has not changed and we're at a gross revenue of 8.6 million. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go jump back over and say, yes, I'm good with this data and I want to commit it. So I'm gonna go up here and click on my sandbox and I'm gonna commit the data. And it makes sure that you wanna commit it and it commits that back down to your base data. And once you do this, all of the blue data will um, be committed and it will look like the base data now. And then when we look here, we are in our base data and it has our 260 grown 3% through the end of the year. So if we come back over here, do a quick refresh, it slightly went up here from 8.60, I believe it was, to an 8.62 million. Um, so there's definitely, that data was committed back and it will um, let you see those impacts you know, through the end of the year and visualize it down here on the chart as well. All right, so we've covered sandboxes, we've covered spreading. Um, the only thing I wanted to note on here is that, you know, what, what we have on the chart is your revenue and cost of sales. And so the gap between the line and the top of the bar is your gross um, revenue. I'm sorry, your gross margin, right? So this will give you kind of a visualization where margins start to get tight, where you've got a greater area of, of uh, gross margin showing, you know, towards the end of the year. All right, so we're gonna flip over here now to the g a expenses. And um, again, this is another way your users can manually come in and contribute data. So in here, we might have a team that's gonna come in and put in payroll and office expense, travel, um, you know, I'm sorry, yeah, office expense and travel expenses. Um, and so they could come in and just manually key this stuff in here. We could use spreading, you know, we start with a value and repeat it across the row, um, or we could just copy and paste from Excel, right? So you minimize this, you grab my Excel file that's got my G&A expenses. Put that over here. And we will, oops. We will grab these numbers. And we can come right here and just paste them in. And you can see that we have our office expense consolidation. 
and then I'll grab the remainder of these for office expenses. And I can plug in my travel expenses there. And so this is just a simple input template where your planners can come in and help budget your expenses. And then you can see the impacts uh, across the uh, cube here. So I'm gonna jump over to variance analysis. Um, and so in this scenario here is that maybe the managers have come in and set a target number and you wanna come here and be able to do a quick check to see how your budget numbers are looking um, in this case for compensation. Uh, so you can see how well you are on target. And then we also have a gross margin budget versus target here. Um, so that you can kind of take a quick look at things. And then again, we've built a chart down here that's based off this compensation uh, payroll data to see where we're at on budget versus target. So again, this is all stuff that you can control and maintain within the application. And so, like I said, managers could set targets and then give you this kind of visual to see where you're at compared to target. All right. So for AI forecasting, so this is a brand new feature that came out with this release of Planning Analytics 57. And so in this case, we have a real small cube that's got a couple of items with many years of historical data. And um, what we're gonna do here is show that new AI forecasting feature. So um, as you can see, we have data from 1991 all the way through 2013 and we can forecast all the way out into these empty years out to 2025. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna click on a single item and we're gonna click on the brand new forecast button, which will open up this panel over here. So again, our data goes through 2013 and we wanna forecast all the way out through the end of our time, which is 2025. And so what you get here is you get a preview button when you click on a single row of data. And so clicking on that single row of data will show you the trends that were identified in the data, as well as what the forecast would be with the confidence interval highlighted around it. So within the chart here, right, we have a statistical details uh, section that talks about all of the different values that were evaluated and the parameters that were used and trending and seasonality that were used to make up this forecast. So we haven't com we haven't committed this forecast yet, um, but we're just previewing this single line item. Um, so all of these uh, forecasting algorithms, you know, are available, and the system chooses the best one for you based on what it finds in the data. We'll close that one and we can take a look at one more item. We'll preview that same on here. And so we look at our trend. It's kind of been a very upward trend with a little dip and it's been very linear. So in this case, the linear um, forecast looks very similar, right? So it's going to project out pretty closely to what it's been if this is based off of the historicals. And you can see that our prediction accuracy is high on this one as well. Right. So in order to actually do the forecasting, and I want to do it on all items here, I'm just going to shift click those five items. You'll notice that the preview button goes away. It doesn't preview for more than one item, um, but it does give us the ability to um, go ahead and click the forecast button. Um, before I click on the forecast button, you can see that the scope is five rows have been selected. Again, we set our forecast start and end periods. Um, and there's some advanced features in here to auto detect seasonality, and that is enabled by default. Uh, you can also select time periods to ignore. So if you had a real outlier of a year and you did not want that included in your forecast, you could select to um, ignore that particular year or years. Uh, the default confidence interval is 95%. And then you do also have the availability ability to um, save the data in different versions um, and also capture 
uh, the predicted value and the upper and lower bounds. We're not gonna touch on that today. We're gonna actually just forecast this data uh, into our future years in our actual uh, dimension or version. Right, so let's go ahead and click on forecast here. And so the system will take just a few seconds here to calculate that forecast. As you can see, year 2014 through 2025 have now been populated. Um, we've got a little results summary down here, and it shows that four of our time series had a high accuracy, and one time series had a medium accuracy. And we can click on the details here to see that results summary, and if we expand those out, you can see that item three had a uh, between 30 and 50 percent prediction accuracy. So we had none that had low errors or anything. So, and then you can look at this data here and see that it's po definitely populated a trend um, that would be similar to what we saw on that preview screen. All right. So I'm gonna close down the AI forecasting there. And um, let's see, I think we're gonna push this back to um, the Q&A session now. Chris, I'll turn that back over to you. Yeah, thanks so much, Rob. Great job on the presentation there. Uh, now we are gonna do a quick poll right now. And what this poll is looking to do is understand which version of planning analytics the audience has today. So we've got listed um, four of the most recent versions. And if you don't have planning analytics, uh, go ahead and click uh, click none. I'd be, curious, I'd be curious to see the results on that as well. So we'll go ahead and let that poll uh, run here for a second. While it's running, I wanted to encourage everyone to attend the planning analytics workshop tomorrow. So as Rob mentioned a couple different times, we're going to have Brian Moore uh, leading that session. Um, and it definitely would be a, a good opportunity for you if you've never had the chance before or you haven't had a chance recently to get your hands on planning analytics and to, to better understand what the product is, is like today. Uh, there have absolutely been some game-breaking uh, releases within the past calendar year, um, and, and he's going to be focusing on, on some of that tomorrow. You can register for that workshop at bacon.pmsquare.com. So make sure you do so. It looks like we've got 32% of the votes in so far. Let's let that keep running and we'll get to a, a question uh, first here. And, and actually, while, while we're waiting for that, uh, one more plug for the Genius Bar. So throughout the entirety of, of Bacon, we've got an opportunity for you guys to effectively grab 15 minutes of free consulting. So uh, I would encourage everyone to take, take us up on that. Um, go to bacon.pmsquare.com and, and grab a 15-minute segment and bring your toughest question. Bring the, the issue that, that's really been in your craw recently and stopping you from, from getting something accomplished. Bring a concept or an idea that you want to bounce off someone who's maybe done something similar. Um, we've really seen those sessions. and We've only had the, the Genius Bar open now for maybe six or seven months or so. But we've really seen customers extract some serious value from just having those conversations and being able to use one of our experts as a sounding board for a challenge or an idea. So we're up at 38% on the poll there. Let's get to our first question here for Rob while we let the poll keep running. So, so Rob, for reporting, when would someone use CA, Cognos Analytics, versus Planning Analytics? And could Planning Analytics be a standalone tool for budgeting, forecasting, and reporting? Absolutely, it can be. Um, with the advancements that have come within planning analytics version 57 on the workspace side um, it basically has given you the ability to uh, get a lot closer to doing the pixel perfect reporting that's available in cognos um, you know the the tool gives you everything that's needed to be able to ingest the data uh, transform that data present that data back out create dashboards reporting and visualization. So yes, it can do every bit of that all on its own. Um, as far as consuming it in Cognos, um, the reason you would go to Cognos is to incorporate that with your um, other data that is not living inside of TM1. So if you've got framework manager models, data modules, uh, you can 
you can combine that data into a reporting dashboard that's not capable today within planning analytics. So uh, it really depends on the use case. Definitely planning analytics can provide everything that you would need. Uh, Cognos Analytics allows you to supplement that with additional data sources that are not TM1. Okay, great. We'll go ahead and close the poll now and share the results. So as we look at this here, um, it seems like 73% of people do not have planning analytics today. So hopefully the session was informative and um, showed you what you could expect from it. We do have 7% of people on planning analytics 207 or older. And our, our next question really relates to what, what could be for, could be relevant for some of those more legacy uh, planning analytics or TM1 users. So when someone upgrades from TM1, what happens to the TM1 web apps? So when you upgrade from a legacy version of TM1 to the newer versions, is that the question? Yep. When you upgrade from TM1, what happens to those TM1 web applications that you have in place? So TM1 web is still part of planning analytics. Um, they've just broken that in, out into a separate installer. Um, and it sounds like that's going to continue to go on as a product, right? So TM1 web is still out there. Um, and so you're able to migrate those applications in TM1 web that combines cube views and Excel spreadsheets. Um, you can migrate those to the new version of TM1 web. Uh, Planning analytics workspace gives you the ability to, um, you know, kind of combine some of the cube views, the web sheets and things like that as well into the interface. So you can create your books and tabs as well as uh, you know, do all of the same stuff that you're able to do in TM1 Web. You can do that similarly in Planning Analytics Workspace. And guys, if you are on uh, versions of TM1 10.2.2 or older, um, you'll want to upgrade to the latest release to get you back into support. So 10.2.2 and older is no longer in support with IBM. And so uh, latest releases will get you back into support. Absolutely. So for the 73% of people that took the poll that don't have planning analytics today, you have to assume that some of them are on the world's most pervasive planning tool, Excel. So, Can you speak a bit to where the, the cracks and foundations start to show from a planning strategy based around Excel and really where, where planning analytics can show um, and, and demonstrate the value when you do move to a more enterprise-grade scalable solution such as that. Yeah, so the, the, the Excel is comfortable, right? Everybody likes Excel. It's easy. You, you know how to navigate it. You know how to use it. But you do hit some limitations with Excel when you're trying to put together a large planning model, right? So you could run into issues if you've got low-level grain of data that you're trying to pull in you may run out of rows in Excel. Um, we've been speaking with a prospective client here lately and they have run into the issue where they are out of, out of rows of data in Excel and it's becoming too much to handle in Excel. Um, so in order to you know, build a planning model that can scale, obviously planning analytics can do that. Um, you're not gonna hit a row limit in Excel. Uh, like you're not, you're not gonna hit a low ro row limit like you would in Excel within planning analytics. Um, and then, you know, the advantage is, is centralizing things, right? So you're not going to um, have to rely on spreadsheets that are either passed around and collected and collated together to be able to, you know, get users to contribute data into your planning process. So you really centralize that and eliminate that risk of somebody overwriting a formula, deleting data. Um, or just in general, just breaking the Excel file and then someone has to maintain that. So yeah, definitely planning analytics is, a, is an excellent solution to get you out of Excel planning models. Yeah, and Brian mentioned in his video at the outset, the, the scale capabilities of, of planning analytics is really off the charts. I think he used the term quintillion or, or some number that I'd never heard of before he mentioned it within that video. but. You know, it's an absolutely scalable framework that can support the, the largest of the large potential planning applications. So definitely night and day when you compare that to something that is so row bound like Microsoft Excel. Yeah, and, and speed, right? So there's lots of speed enhancements that you would get moving to planning analytics. 
the consolidation engine that does those roll-ups of the dimensions that I was showing. Um, so when you're taking office locations and rolling them up to a region to total company, all of that natural consolidation happens very fast. The okay, next question we have has to do with um, IBM's cloud offerings. So this customer is on Planning Analytics and Cognos Analytics Cloud. Now, have there been strides made towards going to a single security model? For example, Cognos Analytics has a security model and Planning Analytics uses a separate model. So duplicate versions of users are created as a result. Yeah, we've definitely experienced that with our clients that are on Cognos and Planning Analytics in the cloud. Um, I know they're working towards getting unified, um, and I know you can do federation between your local um, Active Directory or authentication provider that you're using through the IBM cloud, but there is still that disconnect of um, having separate planning users and then separate Cognos users for the same person. So hopefully there'll be some strides made in that uh, in coming releases, but I haven't, uh, I haven't seen anything concrete on that yet. Uh, next question has to do with the sandboxing capability within planning analytics. So when a user creates a sandbox, is that only for them? Are they the only ones that can use it? Or is that something that everyone can work from and, and collaborate on? Yeah, so sandboxes are definitely user specific. Um, so there's no way to share a sandbox today. There was some talk about that there's been some requests for from customers that would like to have the ability to have sandboxes that could be shared. Um, but you can develop a model that eliminates the sandboxing by having versions that are publicly available, right? So you could have, um, you know, a, a, a version in your versions dimension that would be available to all your users so that they could see the impacts and change uh, data within that version without impacting your actual or your budget version. Um, so yeah, not sharing of cross sandbox. Sandbox is very personal. Um, it becomes public when you commit the data like you saw that I did. Um, but again, you could build a model that would allow you to have a version in your versions dimension that could act as a sandbox. Okay, great. Uh, the next question is, is there an equivalent to CAFE so that I can query uh, cubes from Excel? Yes, so um, the planning analytics for Excel, which was the interface that I went into and I pulled that view in from the employee input, um, is your way to uh, query cubes within the planning analytics model. So when you connect through Excel to planning analytics, you will see all of the objects that you have security for on that right-hand panel. Um, and then there's way more options that I didn't even touch on within planning analytics for Excel um, beyond the exploration that I did, but you can make very highly customized reports uh, in planning analytics for Excel uh, that takes the place of what used to be CAFE. Okay, great. Next question has to do with integration between Planning Analytics and Cognos. So is it still possible to integrate and share real-time data with uh, PA in the version they have listed here is 2.0.57 and an old version of Cognos BI that a customer still uses? So likely Cognos 10, maybe even uh, Cognos 8, but a legacy non-11 version of Cognos BI. Yeah, I'm not sure on that because I don't think anything probably before Cognos 11 would support the modern Planning Analytics 57. Uh, I know within the Planning Analytics ecosystem, uh, the, the server component versus the Excel component versus the um, workspace component, you can only be one or two versions behind in certain order in order to have things working correctly, right? Because as they release new features uh, in Workspace and Planning Analytics for Excel, uh, you can't be on a really old version of PA. I think it may only go back to 207 or 208. Uh, so you do have to kind of keep up with both uh, within the PA ecosystem. And I'm pretty sure on the Cognos Analytics side, you would need to be on a newer version to, to get things to work correctly. 
as use, using it as a data source, I don't think that would be an issue in an old Cognos version. Um, other, the only concern I could see there would be that the data source connection that you set up in Cognos may not support the newer planning analytics data source. So you may lose some features between that as well. Great. Uh, this next question is really just learn, looking to learn more about the AI forecast features. So what can you share about uh, AI forecast and really where you personally see the benefit of, of that infusion of technology within planning analytics? Um, so the AI forecasting is brand new. That release I just showed of 2057 just came out not quite two weeks ago. Um, so right now, the best place to get information on that would be the IBM documentation. There's a sample, the cube that you saw me playing with was from the documentation, uh, tells you how to use it and how to, how to work in that AI forecasting panel, as well as the community forums. There's been a few posts that I've seen here since it was released with people asking questions around the AI forecasting and IBM uh, product management is, is involved in those conversations. So if you're, if you have questions, problems, Post to the community forums, and uh, I'm sure you'll get an answer pretty quickly around the AI forecasting as well. The aspiration for that technology really to help um, out of the box planning analytics customers without needing to infuse additional technology, address things like predictive forecasting, predictive inventory management. Is that really where it's looking to go? Yes, um, and it and it's also to keep you from having to interface with external tools, even though they're IBM tools, the SPSS, Watson Studio, right? They're trying to integrate those features and functionality within the AI forecasting piece to make it simpler, so you don't have to take your data out of TM1 or Planning Analytics and do some processing to it and then bring it back in. It helps you stay within the one tool. Okay, great. Well, that is all the time that we have for questions.